Well, hopefully they're actively collecting uh, local information and making it available to the public. It's one thing to have the collection, but you need to make it available um, to have finding aids, help people find what is in the archives, um, as well as you know having things on a website or doing a blog about that particular local history that that library or archive would um, be promoting, and also really publicizing, uh, writing articles, um, maybe in magazines like Michigan History or other sources. So that that's really, I think, the key things. Well, hopefully an archive would have a mission statement. Um, and I know for the archives for you know the Grand Rapids Public Library, I don't have the exact quote, but really we were collecting um, materials from the old Northwest Territory, but really with an emphasis on Grand Rapids and Kent County. So we would collect things you know, really about the whole Great Lakes area, but the main narrow focus is really Grand Rapids and Kent County. Um, and then uh, just for an example, and Grand Rapids is a, a big city and we're lucky that we have such a fine library and an archives, but it's not the case, you know, everywhere. Um, and a good example is the Lee, in Leland, there is the Leland Library in the same building as the archives that the Leland All Historical Society operates. So that's the case, there would be no point in that library having an archives when they're in the same building as the historical society, which has one. So you'll see you know, that varies town to town. Well, I would start by saying, pick a topic that you're interested in and really get a broad overview. Uh, you know, through books, through, do Google, uh, check bibliographies. You can find surprising things in bibliographies and oftentimes you'll find references to archives in bibliographies. Um, and then ask the staff at the archive you're visiting. Um, don't be afraid to, don't be shy, because that's what they're there for. And you may be asking the question in the best way that you know how, but it may send off a light bulb in the staff person like, oh, I think what they really want is this or that. So really, don't be afraid to ask staff what you're looking for. And there may be uh, collections that are in the process of being finalized that aren't online yet, the finding aids not online, but they might be able to still pull the materials for you. I really got involved by starting collecting postcards, <laughs> um, you know, was the, was the main thing. Uh, and I've always um, been interested in Michigan history. I was a bookseller for 22 years, even though I had my library degree, I never applied for a library job for many years. Um, and even when I was a district manager, I always made sure that I had the Michigan section, that I ordered the books for that section in the store where my office was because I was just you know, so interested. Um, and then I um, got the job at the library and it was, at first it was part-time as a library assistant. And that was really my first real exposure to archives. Um, I, I hadn't really visited any archives before that. So that's how I got interested in it. And then um, I really got interested in the history of tourism too, um, kind of at the same time, because I would see references to things either on postcards or in some you know, tourist brochures that maybe the library had or that I you know, saw at an antiquarian book fair or so forth. So that's really how I got started. First and foremost, verify from other sources. Um, newspapers can be notoriously wrong and newspaper articles will be repeated over and over. Uh, so you need to check other primary sources. Newspapers, you can check ancestry.com. Maybe if you're researching a crime, you know, see what criminal records are available to you, you know, through your county or city. Um, the city directories, you know, are a, a great source too. Um, and I had a great example of primary source gone wrong. There, um, we did a book on the West Michigan Pike, and so we we're very interested in that. And there was a historical marker that was placed near New Buffalo, oh gosh, probably like eight or nine years ago. 
and it said that the West Michigan Pike Organization was formed in 1911. And I knew exactly where that came from. It came from the, the um, archives of Michigan. They had the pa part of the papers of William Decline, who was the first president of the organization. And there's a handwritten short memoir of you know, his recollection of how the West Michigan Pike Organization got started. And it said 1911, January 10th, 1911. And so I then looked in newspapers and I found that there was a huge snowstorm on that day. No trains were running to Muskegon where this would have been, but I had meanwhile seen references to 1913. So I checked various newspapers, newspapers.com, you know, 30, 40 articles about this meeting on January 10th, 1913. So there's a case where they went by this, should have been reliable. It was in the archives. It was by the president of the organization, but his memory was faulty and no one checked. All they would have had to do is just check newspapers from that date and see that if there's no trains running, they're not gonna have a meeting bringing people from all over Michigan. I did send a note to the, this was at the time when um, the State Historic Preservation Office was doing them. And I told the people there that there was a mistake, but it was already at the foundry. And it's very expensive to correct it. So I don't think unless there's a huge uproar. I only know of one case where a historical marker was really corrected. I mean, there could be more. I only know of one. Well, it's very simple. They're just stories that aren't told. They're missing. That you know, there's there's not a lot to say about it because they're not there. I think partly it's um, created by the mission statement. Um, the a focus of a particular archives might be very narrow. That maybe they only collect Dutch history. Uh, you know, like. Or, or you know some ethnic group or something so that that could be part of it it's also what comes in from donations what comes in you know as purchases and unfortunately there um, are some people don't think what they have is worthwhile donating you know maybe their family history maybe it was a prominent african-american family but you know None of the kids wanted the material and they thought, well, they, they, it maybe just would never cross their mind that it was worthwhile, you know, to donate. And then there's also time and neglect, just, you know, things don't get done, time passes, forget it, people forget about things. Um, and a great example of this was um, at the Grand Rapids Public Library, the director of the library during World War I was involved in sending books to the soldiers overseas. At that time, uh, there was a survey done um, that was called the World War I Women's Cards. It's the Women's National Defense Corps. And he saved those. They were stored in the attic. Gordon Olson knew they were up there and it's like, it's time to bring those down. Well, they're just a, a wealth of information, but if, you know, say Gordon you know, was gone and nobody knew what they were, someone could have thrown them out. Um, so it was you know, really a lucky thing that they were saved. Another example I have, uh, Kevin Boyle, who wrote The Ark of Justice, which is a story about an uh, ASEAN suite, uh, uh, a doctor in Detroit in the 1920s buying a, ho a house in a white neighborhood and he was African-American. And, you know, he grew up with that story. He just thought everybody knew about it. He, you know, didn't think it was important. And then, you know, he was talking to people. It's like, no, that's an important story. You know, you should write about that. Um, another example, and we, we see this, you know, in the Catholic church and other places, but there was a murder of a nun up in Isidore, Michigan. And Marty Link started researching it and the people wouldn't talk to her about it. You know, uh, and something like that, you know, probably wasn't documented in the newspapers. People want uplifting history. They don't want to know about the down and dirty things that happened. Well, I found, I remembered this um, quote and I looked it up. This is an African um, proverb. 
Until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter, which I think is so true. And we see that it's a lopsided view of history, story of white privilege, who the politicians were, you know, the, uh, the leaders, the factory owners in the South, you know, we hear of, you know, the great wealth of the South, you know, the tobacco and all the cotton, but that was, you know, on the backs of the slaves. And even in Michigan, you know, the glorification of the auto industry and, you know, how great Henry Ford was, who did all that work? It was the common laborers, you know? And so, you know, really labor history is very important and often really, you know, underlooked. So I, I think um, that African proverb, I think just, you know, really hits the nail on the head. Dig deeper, you just have to dig and dig. Um, and I think of Carl Bajima, uh, he was a retired professor from Grand Valley who has since passed on, but he um, was interested in the history of forestry and he would go through old newspapers, you know, page by page. And he was doing it for a friend, um, Mel Goolsby, who was interested in early African-American history. So he started copying any articles that were related to African-Americans. Well, then also he thought, well, I might as well do Native Americans. I'll do women's history. I'll do, you know, this and that. And he has, as you know, you know, donated, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clippings of things that he has found in newspapers. And, and be, you know, there are a number of newspapers that are online now that are digitized, but there are still many that aren't. And you really aren't going to find things unless you go page by page and looking. And sometimes you'll find things even in advertisement. Um, I think history is kind of, kind of like mining. You know, you follow a vein and you keep digging until it runs dry, then you start following another vein. And I think too, um, you really need to think broadly of the sources. Um, and I think of Kim Rush doing his work on um, blues musicians in Grand Rapids. And I don't think I would have thought of this, but he did. Well, he thought I should go look at the applications of the musicians union and see what I can find out about, you know, these performers. Great source, you know, that was something he, he really thought broadly. And I think too, um, I find things on, on eBay and it's not necessarily that I need to purchase them, but just as a reference, you can find things there. And that's another case that you need to dig deeper. And I thought about Anna Bissell, you know, there's a collection of her material, but you're gonna find bits and pieces in other uh, collections, um, maybe in some advertising brochures, in the women's, the World War I women's cards, she filled out one of those cards. Here she is, you know, CEO of a big company. And it, um, the cards ask, what would you do to help the volunteer effort? And she said she would offer her chauffeur. So lo and behold, that's, you know, you would, that wouldn't be in her, her own collection, but it's a little, you know, tidbit. And I, um, another example is um, there was a printing company in Grand Rapids called Cargill, and they printed a series of suffrage postcards. Well, if you look at their advertising booklet promoting themselves, they made, they boasted of the fact that they had a lot of women workers and women colorists that, you know, would work on the production line. So I thought, you know, that was interesting. Um, and then, you know, if you're studying a particular ethnic group, um, one thing you might want to do it because you're, you know, they tended to live in certain neighborhoods. So if you had, you know, a couple names that you were looking, you might look and see what street they lived on. Look who else lived on this street. If it's an ethnic name, see what the jobs of the people were. You know, was it a, a neighborhood where there were a lot of maids? There were a lot of, you know, railroad porters. You can, you know, read in between the lines in some of those kinds of examples.
um, well, I love working with the people, you know, and um, Todd Robinson, you know, um, was a great guy, you know, to work with. He did a book on, you know, African Americans in Grand Rapids. Um, I have a great personal story. Um, I was at the Community Archives and Research Center for the, you know, City of Grand Rapids. And um, looking, I knew they had an, a 1920s mugshot book. And there had been a little bit, not much, oral history in the family that my grandfather or my grandmother had gone to jail and nobody ever talked about it. Well, she wasn't in the mugshot book, but then um, Tony pointed out that they also have a record of arrest. So lo and behold, my grandmother was arrested during prohibition. Um, she had a still in the basement and she sold two beers and a pint of whiskey to an undercover cop. And then um, I found verification of that in one of the local newspapers. So I thought, well, that, that, that's really interesting because nobody in the family ever talked about it. Um, and we knew that um, the kids were alone you know, for a while. We don't really even know how long she was in jail. Um, and apparently her husband ran off at some point in time. So that, that was a really interesting example. Um, I have another one that when I was uh, searching on some uh, Green Book places in Michigan, I've, I've done a lot of research on that. And uh, starting with Google, I had, um, I, I knew that this place existed and it was listed in Bayshore, which is just right near between Charlevoix and Petoskey. And there was a gentleman named Zach White. So I looked him up on Google and lo and behold, the Charlevoix Historical Society had some information on him. They had some ads. He was a musician. He had a jazz band in the 20s called Zach White and the Chocolate Bowl Brummels. They were from Cincinnati. But in the summer, he operated a boarding house in Charlevoix uh, that would house all the African-American workers that were working in the hotels and so forth. And then uh, later on, he gave that up and had a restaurant. Um, and he would still play up there with his band. Um, and they had uh, the Charlevoix Historical Society sent me some ads uh, and some uh, photos and stuff. Uh, they didn't have a lot of information and they said they never even knew about him until about a year ago and someone else had asked. So I don't know what that person, how that person found out about him, but you know, there's some little treasures like that. Um, one thing I found on eBay, it wasn't anything I was interested in purchasing, but um, I've been looking for Michigan tea rooms. I'd like to do an article on that. And I knew about one in Bloomfield Hills called Devon Gables. And there was someone selling a little bar of soap from Devon Gables and it listed the address in Bloomfield Hills. And then it also listed one in Grand Rapids at 102 East Fulton. Like, well, I never knew they had one here checked with the archives at the library. And sure enough, they were there for about five or six years um, in the 1930s. Never knew that, but you know they were listed in the city directories. And another thing that I stumbled on uh, searching for the Green Book this time, um, and I, I looked um, just a, a general Google search um, for Joe Lewis Spring Hill Farm, never thinking that it would really be the famous Joe Lewis. I just thought, you know, what would the famous Joe Lewis be doing with a farm? You know, uh, well, he had a farm and a riding academy in uh, near Utica, Michigan and Shelby Township. And then I got more information from uh, the archives there. So it's like, you just kind of never know where you're gonna find stuff. Well, um, I can try to go chronologically. I really got started in collecting postcards first of railroad depots. Um, and then of course it just broadened and that directly led to an uh, interest in the history of tourism in Michigan because I would see all these resorts on postcards. Um, then I started collecting ephemera, tourist brochures and booklets, maps, and things like that, um, sometimes put out by a specific hotel or resort, sometimes put out by a chamber of commerce or a tourist association. Then that led to um, really researching the history of the West Michigan Tourist Association, which was started in 1917. Um, 
And I did a lot of work on that and um, helped them with their uh, 100 year anniversary a couple of years ago. Um, then this interest in um, Michigan travel and tourism led, we've done five books in our Vintage Views series um, that really focus on the history of tourism. Um, we started with Leelanau County, then we did um, Charlevoix and Petoskey. Uh, we did um, the West Michigan Pike, uh, which is the road that eventually became US 31. Uh, and then um, of course, Mackinac, the Mackinac Straits area we did. And then our newest is on M22. And those are in that series. And then we also did a book um, about a year and a half ago for the Leelanau County Historic Preservation Society, uh, documenting all the officially designated places in Leelanau County, places that either had a historical marker or a historical designation from the state or from um, the federal government. And so that was a fundraiser um, with the idea of getting more historical markers. And um, last year, we worked on an application for an airport uh, for historical marker up in Northport. Um, it was a very interesting story. The airport was named after a pilot. Um, this was after World War I, um, who uh, was on a goodwill tour of South America. And he crashed and, you know, unfortunately he and his co-pilot died, but that, that's a whole story there. And we just found out the marker is going to be delivered um, in a couple of weeks, but we're not going to have a dedication until spring or summer. <laughs> There's nobody up there in the winter and the ground's too frozen. Um, so that's, that's something recent. Um, I've also, um, for the last couple of years, uh, been really interested in uh, the Green Book, the Motorist Green Book for, for Negro Motorists is what the subtitle was. Um, and I've done a lot of work on that, collecting images um, and uh, advertisements, things like that. And you, you just, you know, you kind of never know where you're going to find something. Um, I, I go to postcard shows and antiquarian book fairs and, you know, search online, but I've really come up with quite a, a treasure trove of images. And I've contacted virtually all the historical societies and museums of the towns um, where some of these places were. And sometimes they're really helpful and other times they never heard of this place um, and have no idea. Uh, and of course, a lot of these places weren't advertised. Um, it was word of mouth. So it doesn't surprise me. Um, and, you know, I think most of them really tried to be helpful. Um, so that was really good. Um, so I, I, Tom and I have a column in Michigan Blue Magazine, which their last issue is going to be this 2021 February, March, and then it's disbanded, um, but that's been fun. We um, really have a pick of doing whatever topic we want. So we've done everything from dude ranches in Michigan to the mystery spots to um, slogans, various towns and slogans that Michigan used. And that's been really a fun thing. I'm really sad to see that end. And then of course, with the Historical Society, um, I worked a lot on the parks book that we did, you know, Keep on the Grass, the history of, you know, Grand Rapids Parks. And during my, um, you know, job at the library, I would work on whatever project was going on. <laughs> One of my um, little things I, I kind of tried to do anytime we'd run across an image of um, Christmas scenes in Grand Rapids. I made copies and have a notebook of the Christmas things. And I, I think that would be fun to do something with that down the road sometime. Well, um, we have our postcards and notebooks um, that are mostly set up by geography, but sometimes they're set up by topics. Um, and sometimes I'll make colored copies and have something by topic where I'll have the original um, by the geography, by ever what, what town that's in. So gosh, we have last um, year at the beginning of the pandemic, this was a 
project I was going to do like when I first retired and it's been eight years, but I had to wait for the pandemic to kick in, but I reorganized all of our postcards. We have 81 albums um, that, you know, are mostly like two or three inch notebooks. Um, so that's quite a lot of postcards. And then uh, I have a big ephemera collection too. Um, and that I store in archival boxes. Um, I'm lucky to have a Not particularly. I knew I, I wanted, I mean, I got my library degree after college um, and I knew I would eventually want to be a librarian, but I loved the book business um, and I, I still am, you know, really try to keep up on, especially Michigan books. I'm on the Michigan Notable Book Selection Committee, so that really helps me, you know, keep in, in touch with um, what's going on. Um, but that job ended. I was a district manager for a regional chain. And so I was lucky um, to, I knew Gordon Olson from the bookstore. Um, and, you know, I was able to get a part time position there. And I had a library degree, but there were no full time openings for a couple of years. But then when someone retired, I got the local history librarian job, which really was my dream job. I loved it every minute of it. Well, I think, you know, when a lot of times when you look at history, it's a mile wide and an inch deep. And I think in local history, you can dig below that inch um, and you can find stuff that relates to you directly. Um, when I was working at the library, we had a class um, of fifth graders that came every year to do their house histories. And I think for some of them, that was the first time that they really thought about like what went on in their house, what, what was going on in their neighborhood. Um, and I think it really brought history home. And I think um, that's happening now with this pandemic. I think people are really um, documenting what's going on. And I, I think there's gonna be a much more large wealth of information than say after the 1917-18 flu epidemic. I think future historians will have a lot to look at. Be aware of looking for things. And I, you know, I try to go to as many author presentations and that I can and um, a lot of them now these days are virtual. But um, I went to, uh, I attended a virtual one uh, that the Historical Society of Michigan did on Idlewild. And um, it, it was fine. It wasn't the, you know, the best presentation I ever had seen, but the author mentioned a couple books at the end. And lo and behold, there was a book that I didn't know about, which shocked me. <laughs> I thought I knew all, everything that it was written about, you know, Idlewild. And this was about Woodland Park. Um, and uh, I was able to get the name of the author from the presenter and contacted her. Um, and she has done a great history. Woodland Park is near Idlewild, um, another African-American resort community. And she's written a wonderful book. And reading through that, you know, I kind of vaguely knew there was African-American branches of the Civilian Conservation Corps, but to know there was one uh, right there um, or near there, um, that was really interesting uh, operating out of Baldwin. So, you know, and now I've, I've kind of been interested in the CCC for years, but now I have like a little more of a nudge to be interested in it. <laughs> 